Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Advantest with Ira Leventhal. He's going to talk today about applying machine learning to post-silicon validation. Ira, what are some of the issues that you have to deal with when you're dealing with post-silicon validation? So in post-silicon validation, it's really important to understand in great detail the behavior of the device. Uh, we're not only uh, trying to determine if there were any issues that came up in the design of the device and catching those early on so those can be fixed, but we're also trying to determine what is the right approach to being able to test the device as accurately as possible, as reliably as possible, and make sure we're making the right pass-fail decisions. What does the flow look like here? So typically with, with post-silicon validation, the, the flow is very different than if you're, let's say, doing a production test, where with a production test, you're, it's kind of no nonsense. You want to, be, you want to get on the tester, you want to take the measurements you need to, make your pass-fail decisions, and then get on to the next device. In post-silicon validation, you're going to be spending a lot more time on the tester, understanding in great detail the behavior of the device under all kinds of different operating conditions and getting as much insight as possible as part of that process. Let's drill down into this. Sure. What are we looking at here? Well, we've developed uh, some proprietary machine learning algorithms which uh, help us gain, gain greater insight during the process of post-silicon validation. And we apply those machine learning algorithms in two different ways. Uh, basically, what we're trying to do is understand as much as possible ab about how the inputs to the device affect the behavior of the outputs. And so there's two challenges there. One is that you need to, tr to smartly traverse the data space so that you're not spending months collecting every combination of uh, inputs possible and how they affect the outputs. You need to have a smart way of traversing that space, and this is where the first the machine learning algorithms come in to uh, collect that data in a smart way and where it starts seeing relationships between inputs and outputs, collecting more data in those areas of interest. So we, we have an algorithm to collect that data, and, and so we spend the time on the test system collecting all of that data in the smart way that I described. Once that data is collected, we basically have a model of the device uh, in all of the different operating conditions, we can then go offline and using that model do very detailed analysis, once again using machine learning algorithms to find the hidden relationships and complexities that we, we wouldn't see if we were just using some of the standard uh, analysis tools like Schmoo plots or other statistical analysis tools. Any surprises show up that you didn't expect? Uh, absolutely. So in this particular case, uh, we were applying the algorithms uh, to the, the problem of what is the best way to calibrate uh, one of the chips that's going on our penny electronics cards. And so based on the design of the chip, in the example I show here, there were two expected relationships of inputs to the output VDEV, and those were the VEXP input and the driver state input, which could go into one of two different states. So what I'm plotting here is the, the, the data that we collected on the relationship between the two inputs, VEXP and driver state, on the output VDEV. And we collected that data to determine how to calibrate uh, the effect of those inputs on the output so that we would have the, the minimum RMS error under all operating conditions. And so, sure enough, the data shows there is a relationship between these two variables on the output, and that was expected. And what we found was when we went ahead and did the calibration using only those two variables, we were able to achieve an RMS error of 600 uh, microvolts. And how, how far can you go in terms of improving that? So, this is where the machine learning algorithms came in and were able to find a hidden relationship that we either, ne neither we nor our IP provider expected when they did the design of the chip. And so what the system found was by going through and analyzing all the different combinations and finding you know, what was going on that, that, that you know, humans or standard statistical techniques couldn't see, there was a third variable, V-swing, which had a significant uh, effect on the, uh, the error depending on the value. So what we did here was after taking out the error, after doing the calibration, essentially taking out the error from the, uh, the VEXP and driver state, we were then able to plot to show that 
Sure enough, depending on the value of V-swing, there were certain conditions where it was having a significant input on the, uh, the, the V-dev output. And the, so then the system was able to show us that by adding V-swing into the calibration, we were able to reduce the RMS error down to under 200 microvolts. And that was a very important result for us because it enables us to achieve a better accuracy for the device. And so then the, with the greater accuracy, now the results from our test system could be more accurate and more dependable. What do you do with that? Does that, that information that you've collected there now go back to uh, the suppliers in the supply chain? Does it get moved up into the manufacturing? Where does it go? So in this case, we went back to our IP provider and showed them the data that the, uh, the system had uh, found for us. And they were very surprised. They said, wow, I did not expect this uh, effect at all uh, when I did the design. But they went back and they looked at the details of the design. And within one day, they were able to find out why they ended up with this uh, uh, impact from this input voltage V swing. And uh, so that helped them in terms of future designs to be able to minimize that type of impact. Uh, and then it also helped us in terms of now that we had the insight and understood this relationship, we were able to add V-swing into our calibration routine and come out with a more accurate chip. So test no longer is just test. It's now test, pull out the data, understand what it can do, analyze that data, dissect it, shift it around to wherever it needs to go in the supply chain and then pull it back together so you get a much better result the next time, right? Absolutely. Uh, we have so many great tools available to us right now to gain greater insight into what's going on with the data. Uh, uh, tools that uh, allow uh, finding these hidden relationships, finding these unexpected uh, influences that you know, we couldn't see using the tools that we had at our disposal before. And it's not only uh, isolated to just the different steps within the semiconductor manufacturing process. Some of the real power can be unleashed by taking the data from all the different steps of the process, from design through a post-silicon validation, uh, through a wafer sort test to final test, all the way out to system level test on the end devices. And being able to collect all this data, push that up into the cloud, do analysis of it using these advanced techniques and gain much more insight into the data. The upshot of this is when you put all the pieces together, you should come out with a better result based upon the data that you're using and how, it, how it's analyzed as opposed to just putting pieces together and trying to figure out how they're going to work out in the end, end market after production. Uh, definitely, and with the complexity of the devices, with moving to new process nodes, uh, it's, it's very uh, difficult to go through that entire process and optimize each step without considering the data that's being generated across the entire flow and gaining as much insight from that data as possible. Ira Leventhal, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome.